Well, good evening. Um, we will call this public hearing and our Planning Commission meeting to order. Uh, and I want to welcome all of you for attending. Um, by way of introduction, we are the Planning Commission. Um, John McCullum, who brings us the wealth of knowledge of how to make maps and critical thinking. Gary, who um, brings us our sweet things for our sweet tooth. Uh, sometimes, sometimes he didn't. Brings to us the sense of common sense uh, to our, um, and historic, historic, uh, whatever I want to say, the history behind a lot of things that, that have happened here in East Calus, in Calus. Melanie Keene um, gives us the expertise of keeping within statute so that we are not uh, renegades to the state. Ha ha ha. Also bringing a sense of, of a different kind of critical thinking. And I'm Jan Olson, who tried to facilitate and bring all this together. Um, I happened to think the other day that my first job and one of my last jobs as a product marketing manager was to write specifications for a coder. Now, isn't that appropriate for, <laughs> for writing regulations? I don't know. <laughs> So tonight, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, our agenda tonight will be kind of a brief agenda, but um, it, it'll cover a lot of things that we start. Oh, I have to thank Donna, who's taking the minutes. All right, now we'll get going. <laughs> um, so what we're going to have tonight is an outline of the overall changes. Um, I would encourage you. There is um, the, the report, the required report, which we have to submit to the state and also to the uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning. Um, and it's done in two parts. I would encourage everybody to take it home and read it. It's kind of intense, maybe. Um, so we're, and in this is the amendment of what we've been working on since um, our September 20th first public hearing. So we're going to go over the overall changes. We're going to go look at the changes that were made after the first meeting, first hearing. And then we're going to renew, um, review all of the Shroud and, and actually River Corridor changes. And this is going to be looking at it at the maps so that you can kind of see the difference. And, um, and then just we'll keep our mouth shut and we're going to listen to you. <laughs> That's basically what we're going to do. Um, OK. so. <clears throat> When we started looking at shoreland, um, we were looking at the current shoreland district and found that um, about 60% of the cottages and houses in the shoreland district were non-compliant. They were either 0.17 acres, 0.5 acres, they never met the three acre requirement um, of the shoreland district. We also found a couple parcels <laughs> that were in shoreland that did not own shoreland, uh, any shoreland land, you know, they, they didn't have any access. So we felt that that wasn't quite um, good either. Um, and so we also felt and heard from many of the residents on the various lakes that they wanted to have some kind of regulation that would match or align better with what the state's State Protection Act was for shoreland. So we had a, a goal as we were looking at all of this to, um, to do a shoreland overlay. And uh, there were some comments about the shoreland overlay. They didn't like the idea of a shoreland overlay. They would prefer to have a district. But we decided that we would actually keep, the, keep it as a shoreland overlay district, which we call the Shroud. So here on in, I'm calling it the Shroud so that you know what it means. <laughs> um, we also felt that having an overlay would provide a greater control for the protection of water quality, um, the animals and the um, amphibians and things that live around the various lakes here. Um, and so we decided to stick with that. The other component is erosion and runoff control. And we added a new section, 3.15, which is to be used for all districts. 
which applied to uh, how to control erosion and stormwater management when you were having development. Now, the state requires something at one acre. So if you uh, disturb more than one acre, you have to apply for a permit at the state. What we simply did is said, whatever you do, uh, even if it's under one acre, we encourage people to use the same standards that the state is using to monitor and prevent um, erosion control. The biggest problem that um, we heard when we were doing research with various people in the, I think Melanie went to the river department, or river, yeah. Um, and what they were telling to us is, it's not so much the size of the buffer that's the problem. Their, their concern is erosion control and stormwater management. And when you look at the, our roads, which are all next to a lake, think of all the runoff that goes all over the road and into the lake, or into the Kingsbury branch, or into any of the branches around Peak and Brack Brook. So we, we put in 3.15. The second big thing that we did um, in this update is flood hazard overlay was totally rewritten, and we added a river control, uh, a river, what do I want to say, river corridor overlay, um, which is brand new. Now, we did that for a couple of reasons. Um, the town can get an emergency relief assistance fund. Right now, we're at 12%. This means that if, if a, a disaster happens, um, the state will help pay up to 12% um, in, in flood relief rather than us as individuals that have a problem. By adding river con corridor overlay, we add 5% and we're going to get to a 17% return on the emergency relief assistance fund. So we're kind of doing it for a monetary reason. But what was interesting in looking at the river corridor is there are a few houses that exist that are in the river corridor. Uh, we looked at should there be any building in the river corridor, and we opted to say there will be no new development in the river corridor, absolutely none. It's easier for us as a town to manage, um, and so that's where we're, we're going with that. Um, so that was the other addition. The other kind of larger thing was um, relative to the design advisory board in section 5.5. Um, there were some things in, that are in existence today that we, as planning commission, felt we were not responsible for doing a lot of things that it said we were. So we rewrote the process of how the design advisory board would work relative to both the zoning administrator and DRB review. Um, and we tried to outline the process um, so that it would be understandable. Um, I'll speak more on that later. Then we did um, a lot of the miscellaneous tweaks. Um, we created a um, project worksheet to be used for uh, people that are building on agriculture. I don't know whether you know that farms can almost build anything at any time without a permit. Um, but we wanted to know where they were putting the building. And so that's why we developed a worksheet so that at least we would find out um, where they're putting the building. They don't have to pay a permit. I mean, they're, they're ag. Um, and so we, um, we did that. We had put in a waiver, but we couldn't agree on a few things on how to make it work, so we took it out after our September meeting. We aren't going to have the waiver possibility. And I would encourage a lot of people to read the big new chapter on definitions. Definitions are probably one of the most important things around. Um, I think it'll be helpful when DRB has to do some kind of decision making um, to, to read and look into those definitions. So basically, that's what we covered in our September 20th meeting. Um, go ahead, next time. But I don't think we were very good at explaining what we were doing. <laughs> so we had um, a lot of help 
in looking and relooking at especially the shoreland regulations. Um, so I want to thank Larry. I want to thank Noreen. Uh, David Ellenbogen and John Rosenblum uh, attended a lot of our meetings. Um, they were instrumental in helping us uh, reach where we, uh, a much better uh, sh shoreland overlay, shroud. And I, we must thank Ann Winchester who stepped in and helped us before she became a select board member um, to write this language in a way that, that helped us move it through um, and make it better. So uh, we wouldn't probably be here today without her help, to be honest. What the changes that we made after between September and today's meeting. Um, we had kept, thought we would meet and stay with what the state wanted and have a 20% impervious surface. But our history in Calus is to have a 10% impervious surface. And it was felt important by the Conservation Commission and the lakes and streams that we keep it at 10%. So we will be different in more ways than one um, from what the state has. We, we will extend our upland and our buffer that goes over a road. It does not stop at a road. If there's a property owner that goes beyond the road, they will be expected or encouraged to, um, to use the best management practices on that side of the road. Um, then we're different with the impervious surface at 10%. The other thing is the state has a thing called 40% cleared area. Is it 40 or 20? 40. 40. It is Thank 40. you. Right. So the state does 40, but our calculation of the 40% cleared land is going to be only the amount of land in the upland area. And when we do the maps, you'll see what we mean. It's that property that goes from 100, uh, from the buffer to the outer extension. And in the case of East Callis uh, and Curtis Pond, what do I say, Curtis Pond, um, that goes, they have a 750, a 700 uh, foot upland because on the east side, they wanted an 800, huh? 800. Yeah, but it's 700 upland. Oh, plus the- And right, the 100 right, buffer. Right, right. Yeah. You're right, beg your pardon. This will all, it sounds like mud, but when you see the maps, you'll see. Um, <clears throat> The, there's a lot of non-conforming structures in the shoreland area. Um, so we articulated better, I think, what the DRB is going to be expected to review uh, to those non-conforming structures. Um, we covered things like bank stabilization, which had not been in there before. Uh, for members of the select board, um, the State Protection Act also has standards for roads that are by the lake. And I'm hoping that as review is done of our road standards, that some of those standards near the lake that run by the edges of our ponds might be subject to some of those standards that we may not have now. It's just a future thing. Um, <clears throat> We also put in that in this upland area, um, there's specific development. Now, when we compare the difference between a rural residential district and a shoreland district, there's very little difference in what you could do. But there are a few things that we went through that we felt should not probably be developed in the upland. And thus, there are some things that could be developed, but they need stricter DRB review. So those are put into the standards for this change. And the other big change is we went from a 20% slope to a 15% slope. Um, there are some folks that still want a 10% slope. We felt we could compromise at a 15%. Um, so those are the changes that we made. Other changes, when you're doing regulations, you have to have not only what you're doing here, but it has to be connected and interconnected to other sections of the regulations. So we had to make some changes to sections 3.8, um, 3.12, which is natural resources, 3.13, which is slope, 
and 3.14, which is water um, protection. Um, so we did some work and cleared up some language on that. Um, oh yeah, maximum slope is 15%. And then um, we, we did a re total revision of the design review historic district between this time, uh, September, and now. Uh, and added a lot more <laughs> definitions. So um, with that, let's go to some maps so that some of this could be a little bit clearer. And I'll open up for questions then. So, in looking at this, um, what you have here is our existing um, zoning districts around the lakes, and our um, we have a 50-foot buffer, vegetative buffer, 150-foot um, equivalent of an upland, I guess. Um, and it's kind of almost a no-build zone. It's, a, it's almost no, but yeah, but they can build in it. Not really. Yeah. Not according to our regs, 150 feet from the water. Yeah. Oh, that's the setback from the water. Yeah. 150 feet. Um, and then we have the lakes. Now, um, our current uh, reg regulations are for 20 or yeah, are for 20 acre lakes. The new regulations are for 10 acres. So we ended up adding new lakes that were uh, had not been on before, and that included things like um, Watson Lake, uh, Mud Lake up in the northeast area, which is way up here. Adamant Pond. Um, and Adamant Pond. So um, if we, John, let's take off these, and let's just first go to the proposed zoning districts. In doing our review um, of the zoning districts, most everything that this is red, this red checker thing, that's rural residential. That's a three acre minimum, very similar to what the Shoreland District is today. The, um, and you'll see here the red checker, whatever you want to call this, is right here next to Curtis Pond. So some parcels are going to be both rural residential and village, sort of kind of what they are now, except that instead of the Shoreland District, it's rural residential. Uh, the people in Adamant, right now, their village district goes all the way up through the lake. <laughs> but they said they would be willing to reduce their village and make their, okay, yeah. I don't, do you want to concentrate on animate for a while? Yeah, I'm on animate, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I just want to show, they, they agreed to reduce, this is the way they are now. They have a village district that goes all the way around the lake. They agreed that they felt they wanted to protect their lake, so they stopped their village. They said they wanted everything along here to be rural residential, and their village district would be way down here. It was about a third of the way up the right. yeah. east side of the lake. Jan, are you talking about Sodom Pond? Or no, 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 Adamant Pond. Adamant Pond. Okay, so up <coughs> closer to the music school. Right, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and, and I thought, okay, then let's go on to North Callis is the, old, is the other one that had a little bit of a, well, quite a bit of a difference, actually. Um, okay, so I'll put on the, yeah, the existing. Put on, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So what happens now, what you have now is, this is the Shoreline District, and their village district is along here. Um, what happened over the course of the year, um, 
they wanted to become a village designated center so that they could have uh, make use of getting some grants for Memorial Hall. And in doing that, um, we, knowing that we were looking at a, a, a smaller overlay, uh, we made it, it, we agreed with them, and so our proposed zoning for North Callis is this, uh, which in, incorporates all of this here. Now, in each case, Adamant um, and the southern end of Curtis Pond, which is closer to um, Worcester Road, um, and this area here, the water flows out this way. So everything around this lake will be rural residential, with the exception of through here, which will be village. And that's the way it is. So now, if we go to the vegetated buffer, You can see that here's a 100-foot buffer around the lake. And then if we add the shoreland up the shore, the upland area, our overlay is all the way out to here. So the protection of the lake goes down through here. And this is Nelson Pond. Um, and those are some of the basic differences. Uh, you want to put Cur Curtis Pond on so we can show the 800 foot thing. So what Curtis Pond looks like, <laughs> on the east side, on the east side they wanted an 800 foot overlay. Uh, well, a total eight of 800 feet as, as an overlay, of which 100 foot is very buffer and 700 feet is upland. Who is they? Um, <laughs> lakes and streams in the conservation. And so why is the east side of Curtis Pond have such a wide and no one else does, no other place does? Jan, could I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm happy to talk about both of those organizations, but we weren't the ones who came up with that. This was, my understanding is that it was the landowners themselves well, I don't know. Nobody's spoken to me, or I've never heard anything from any of the other landowners. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, basically because it was a request of people that we heard, that they wanted greater... Um, uh, could I know who they are? Pardon? I, I'm pretty in touch with a lot of people on the pond, and I don't know of any... I, I can find out how many people have asked for that. Hmm. Well, it was, it was the people who came in here. It was the people who came to our meetings that we heard. Several times, yeah. and I can't remember, but it should be in the middle. It just seems uh, pretty unfair. If the 700 feet is in that one spot, which I'm a, we own property in that area, it just seems that maybe a couple people are on the pond, but I'm just wondering about, has everybody been notified on the pond? I mean, I know you have your meetings, but do a couple people get to have the say rather than the people that have come to the meeting that are from the lake have been pretty adamant about wanting an 800 foot on the eastern side of, the, of Curtis Pond. And we decided to accede to that wish. Gabriella? What, where are we at in the process? So what is, like if, if Marge wanted to talk to her neighbors and understand this better, where are we with this? We've okay, been doing this. On. We've been doing this. For I will years. commit Harry Carey. How's that? Oh, oh, you I will commit Harry Carey. <laughs> well, I just, you know, if 700 is needed on the east side, why isn't it needed on the west side around Nelson Pond or any of the other places? We've got a letter from the chair of the Conservation Commission that wants to see the upland district extend 500 feet from the water instead of 250. 
On all the pines? Or yes, yes, all the pines. Yes. Right, that was our, that was our position, but it wasn't yeah. taken, so. Donna's got a question. I, I just I have a question, I have a statement, because I, I have to listen to these meetings <laughs> twice a month for the last two years. <laughs> um, they have had many meetings, and they've been worn on front porch form in all the yeah. usual places. And last year, they tried to move this process along, and frankly, did not get support from the select board. They had hoped to have this done by this town meeting, right? So yes. it could be voted we on. We wanted to have it voted on in March. Yeah. And we could not do the quality of work that we wanted to do by March. So for, to make it in time for the vote, it had to go to it has to go to select board, and it has. And uh, our history is that we take our standard and our regulations and are voted on by the town. So the process um, probably would be, in my mind, is we were going to go forward with this change. Uh, and if people want us to redo and revise um, the, um, the regulations for the next go around, we will add it to a list of changes for the next update. This standard and what we've done here includes River Corridor. It includes a lot. And when you vote for this, yes, you are voting for the whole packet, not just Shoreland. You're voting for everything that we have been working on for four years. Marge, I think, um, I think specifically uh, addressing your question about, you know, why is it a different size there than elsewhere I really think, I, I believe, I believe that what it comes down to is the intensity of the development along that side of Curtis Pond already and how many non-conforming uh, structures there are. Whereas in, in other places that, uh, that are around other ponds with, with a couple of very small exceptions, um, the, the places that are intensely developed around other ponds and on other sides of Curtis Pond are, uh, are now in, uh, are not intensely developed right now and have uh, protection from, uh, three acre minimum protection from being in uh, rural residential or uh, particularly on the western side of Curtis Pond are steep slopes and are and are prevented from uh, any development because of that, because they exceed 15% slope. So when we when we did a review, and, and we truly did do a review lot by lot around all of the bodies of water in Calais, including up and down the river corridors, uh, we, we couldn't really argue against the people who articulated their concern about the eastern side of Curtis Pond as being a sep as being a special uh, situation in Calais, uh, just because of the existing density of of uh, development there and the and the number of uh, non-conforming lots that are adjacent to that property. Uh, so that's that's what they were going for there in order to try to extend nominally the same. Uh, protection as other places. Really, um, it, you know, if we went 250 feet on that side of the pond, the, the part that right now is in the overlay uh, would become part of the uh, uh, rural residential district, and and the rural residential district has, uh, a, to a large degree, the same uh, constraints from development. So. Um, you know, with the exception of a, oh, I don't know, a, a fuel storage facility and yeah, and uh, a, a, a lawn and garden center and you know, things like that that are which are spelled out that are specifically um, that are specifically uh, prohibited in the in the overlay district. That really, the upland, uh, I mean, the uh, yeah, the upland a portion of the shoreland district has very similar regulations to the rural residential district. So, um, you know, when we held all those things in balance, it seemed like it was, uh, it was, a, it was worthwhile to, um, to um, accede to the requests that were put in front of us. So, didn't seem like it was 
uh, it was a, it didn't seem like it was a great burden on you and other people in your situation, and it did seem like it um, it made sense from a density of development standpoint. So that's really uh, my take on how this shook down during these hearings. Can I ask a clarifying question? You just said that the landowners requested this. Is it the landowners on the eastern side that requested it, or landowners on <coughs> another side of the pond? Because you said they kept coming to the meetings. The most local people that have there. attended our meetings have been from Curtis Pond. So somewhere on Curtis Pond, but not necessarily. Well, that's that's where the people live on Curtis Pond. Right, but not necessarily the folks. Because she was asking whether they were warned or not. Well, I mean, you didn't hear about it, right? Well, I know this stuff was going on, but I guess I didn't realize that it was going to be 700 feet. That well, was. It, but it, but it, is, it now. is now. It already is. It's not. We're not making the, those regulations more stringent. Um, we're just right now. You we're just retaining, retaining um, the uh, those I regulations in that area. I don't know enough of what we can do or can't do now compared to what we have been doing or what is there's not much difference it, it uh, short of, of, of going out and, and reading the new changes um, here John do you agree with that statement there's not much difference I'm sorry what do you agree with that statement that yes um, as far as uh, dimensional standards are the same as rural residential as far as setbacks and uh, and uh, minimum acreage uh, there is the 40 percent maximum clearing where in rural residential, you've probably seen examples around town here and there, people can clear cut, basically. You can't, and in, the, in this pink crosshatch, it's only 40%, and that includes new impervious surface. So that would be the total amount of cleared and impervious surface that you could add to any of the pink crosshatched area. But it doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean that you can't develop it. In fact. Some of these, some of these pink shaded areas are large enough to support another building, an accessory dwelling, for example, and it would still be completely compliant with the with the zoning regs. So the the pink isn't an, isn't like a no build zone. It, the pink, the, the pink the, is exactly the same as your shoreland is now. Your shoreland yeah, is except there. for some uses. Yeah. In, in uses and in setbacks and in everything like that. So basically. Which, and I guess I just don't understand why Curtis Pond was on the east side. Well, Single out. Basically because people came and talked to us about it. That's all. Loud, loud people. Isn't there a hill on the west side? Isn't there a hill on the other side? Yes, very, very steep. Yeah, and, and, it, and way up on that, that's resource recreational, which is 10 acre, I think, is it? Or is it 25? No, there's no development potential on the west side. Yeah. Um, Rose, and then yeah, um, just because it looks like such a pretty map, can you like point to the Callis Worcester Road or where the Maple Corner store is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the Worcester Road. That's Worcester Road. Maple Corner store is this one uh, or this one? And and, and Camp no, this Road would be. Pardon, which one? Camp Road, like near the dam, the dam is right there at that little point, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so when you drive on the Worcester Road, you really only see that much of Curtis Pond. Yeah, yeah. The, this, the road is here. Yeah, yeah. and then all the, the rest is. Right, if you go yeah. on the interactive map that's on our website. Oh, you thank kind of you. See. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. I mean, thank you. This is great. Yep. Thank you. I just needed to know where I am. <laughs> where am I? Yeah. Um, I wonder if given this conversation, could you just summarize what the change is? Like what what is being proposed that is different? Like what would what what would like if you were to apply now versus if these if this change were to be approved by the town, what would be the difference for somebody proposing something in that uh, Well, when, when a permit application comes in, John might be able to answer this better, when a permit application comes in now for Shoreland District, uh, 
the shoreland district acts, the only thing they have is the 50 foot buffer and 150 foot setback. There is no uh, recommendation for what kind of plants to put in, best, best, ma best management practice for uh, what you plant. Um, the, there is, uh, I had a note here on something. Um, actually, there are no standards in there relative to mowing. Um, it, in shoreland, in the shoreland district. Um, there's, and so we're keeping a 10% impervious surface, which is the same. Clearing is more spelled out. And if you go to the standards within the buffer, there's no new development in the buffer. We've made the buffer of 100 feet to be almost sacrosanct. Um, and the upland area, which uh, in uh, all areas except the eastern side, it's um, it, you can do almost everything except maybe three things, and I don't remember them from the top of my head, and, er and a few things extra that have to go to the DRB to be allowed. But the setbacks are all the same because the setbacks in, in rural residential are the same as pretty much the setbacks as shoreline. I would say that what the over shroud is doing is trying to control how land is developed around the edges of the lake. And I think uh, what was telling to me was, uh, I, I don't know if it was John Rosenblum or, or Noreen who made the comment that we are loving our lakes to death. So I'm asking you to love your lakes to more by having a greater protection around the overlay, using the overlay as that protection method. That's what really, I guess, my request would be. Can I, I just so. chime in? One, one practical reason for all of this is the State Shoreland Protection Act requires that hunt, that buffer, that vegetative buffer, and imposes a lot of these requirements already. So we're sort of conforming our zoning to the state baseline and then going a little further on a few things with the help of um, folks who've been participating in our meetings. Uh, so if that makes sense. So what is the 50 foot vegetation thing mean? Are you going to make everybody put 50 feet worth of vegetation? It's more than 50 feet that the state has imposed on all lakes and ponds greater than 10 areas, acres in area. So we're conforming our zoning to the state requirement. Folks in those areas will still have to get their state permit. But this is the Are zoning there mitigation. I'm so sorry. Mitigation. Yes, the state allows mitigation. Um. Yeah, it might be important to point out. It's, it's okay. Um, first of all, the state and now under these regulations, the town um, has um, a buffer zone that's composed of two parts. The part next to the pond is a hundred feet deep from the mean water line. And that's why in these new regulations, I think it's called a vegetated buffer zone. After that 100 feet, um, there's what's, what's called in, in these regulations, the upland zone, and that's an, another 150 feet. So the total buffer is 250 feet. Um, if I understood your, the, the thrust of your question, the, the, I, I think um, Jan, answered it or hit on it when she talked about how in the vegetative buffer um, under these regulations there won't be any more development. What's there is there and can stay there, but expanding it or or uh, doing other things, you know, clear cutting the trees or something, that that, that wouldn't be permitted under these. So, Thank you. Any other I'm quote? talking about the 100 foot part, not the whole 250 feet. 250 feet is where that 40% clearance and 20% right. and, and impervious. Well, that's for the whole, that's actually for the whole track. Um, but it, but because nothing new can be built in the 100 foot buffer zone, any practical matter, any building we're talking about, any other clearing would be in that upland zone. And I'll shut up, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Can I ask a 
question while you've got that map up there. You've got something in 314 that says there's a geologic formation between the, the dam and the, um, the village. Yes. And that there's no, there will be no digging, trenching, or excavation. Can you just show me where that is? I, I'm curious whether that will affect when we fix the Curtis Pond Dam. <laughs> um, it won't. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, um, I, I can. I can. Uh, maybe. Well, yeah. It's harder on this map. That um, that actually that actually runs right up here. And see this little dotted line here, no. <laughs> where my finger is. Yeah. It's right there. Let me turn on the existing shoreland and then the shape of the existing is actually uh, there. Can you see can you see that line? Yep. That's the one you were pointing to. And where's the dam? Right, right there. there. Right there. So aren't we gonna be digging right there? So but you're in the water, aren't you? Isn't they the dam in the, the water? Yeah, it's done in the water. It goes to the shore. Right. But you're in you're uh, you're under the old regulations. <laughs> so let's not approve anymore. <laughs> but I did have a conversation with Jamie about that a little bit, especially when we were talking about bank stabilization. I mean, it was kind of an interesting, but I think they're covered because they're writing their permit based on the old, old language until this is voted on. The weird thing is, any work in the water can't be touched by a local zone in the state. Well, I didn't hear you last time. Pardon me? I didn't hear you last time. Any work in the water is the jurisdiction of the state that the town has no control. And there is bedrock underneath. That's part of the plan. Yeah, there's... Well... <coughs> Because um, you're planning on putting the anchors into the bedrock. There's, there's actually outcroppings of bedrock all the way up here. You can you can walk. I did walk with the state geologist, and he uh, he ascertained this line, and then from this side of the dam, it actually comes down this way. Uh, and it's 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 visible. It's on the surface, um, and the the regulation is. It's just all about not blasting holes in because it's, uh, you know, that's a watershed. Everything on this side of that, the watershed's this way, away from the pond and, and gets into the brook through a different avenue than going into the pond. And um, so any, any development of, of these properties that are bisected by that uh, had to stay off of the top of that uh, outcropping. Okay, but aren't we going to have to excavate into the bedrock to put those, you say, we're yeah, going to into Yeah, the but they're not, it's kind of we, we sticking it in. Excavate silt to the bedrock. To the bedrock. And then drill pegs into the bedrock. You kind of have to drill a hole, I guess. Because you can't disturb the bedrock. Okay, well, as long as nobody's going to object. So um, I'm assuming um, for, since Ann <clears throat> brought it up, that if the state approves that we do the the repair the repair of the dam that the tape the Department of Environmental Conservation approves, that that would override. We could do that, and the town wouldn't stop us. No, you we we if it, I, according to I think John, the zoning administrator, we have to have that permit from them to even you know what. Right, and that's what we're I'm, right, I'm, and I'm, we'd have to kind of managing the. The permits for the dam, right, and right. Um, Colleen and I have been, and John said that until we get the DC dam safety permit, that he can't really start on the. Uh, that's kind of you not know, really. You need all the state permits before the right. town can. Yeah. So I think you had applied for state protection for the state protection act, hadn't you, SPA? 
I'm sorry. My ears are dropping. I, I, I think you had, I thought Jamie said that you had applied for the state oh, yeah. permit. Oh, we yeah. The Shoreland we Permission Act. Yeah, yeah. Permit Act. Yeah, for yeah. the Shoreland. And yeah, the I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know. The dam safety and the, right. they're pretty close to being right. finished. Okay. Um, are there any more questions about the lakes? Because if not, can we go back to the slideshow yeah. and get to River Corridor? Yep. Uh, real quick, there's the ponds we have now. There are the ponds that will be protected in the future. Can you do it again? A little, little mud, Watson, right. Sodom, and Adamant will be added to the list of protected ponds. Oh, so Adamant is added to the list? Yes, yes. Adamant is added. Oh, Sodom. Okay, right. Yeah. yeah Adamant and Sodom. Okay. And here's a quick look. Here's the 50 foot vegetative buffer. And you go 250 feet from the water. And that, oh, this is existing, 50 foot veg, 150 foot. And then in our current regs, in this area here in Shoreland, there are a couple of uses that are different. Otherwise, the Shoreland really doesn't have an impact. And what we're proposing is the, this one down here, 150 foot vegetative buffer, another 150 feet. That development is allowed, but it's controlled for a total of a 250 foot buffer. And this, we, we forgot to change this to 40% next clearance. Yeah, that, yeah. We can't remember to find everything. Mm -hmm. Done, it. Okay. But anyway, yeah. Okay. And, and the, we, we use this pond as kind of a, a nice way of uh, uh, <coughs> showing what, what it is existing. And here's what the new um, would have. One difference between what we're proposing and what the state has, too, is all this area south of Bliss Pond, uh, Bliss, uh, Bliss Road, is, uh, is protected by our, our overlay standards, right. where, where the state the, says the state stops. We stop at the road. Okay. okay. So, River Quarter, <laughs> which looks awful. Can we enlarge yes. this? No, I guess we can't. I can in, in certain districts, I guess. Um, River Quarter uh, is this yellow line here. Oops. Go ahead. Uh, and these are uh, the rivers that have 50 foot buffers. And these, what, the yellow line? The, the yellow. Let me go to the next slide and you can see yeah. what a river corridor looks like. So, river <coughs> corridor follows. The meandering scenario. Yeah, take a take an average of the meandering path and add 50 feet to the side of it, and that's river corridor, which is basically a no development is allowed. And it, the they used to call it fluvial erosion hazard area, but it was identified by the state as an area that could be severely eroded. The kind of stuff we saw in Irene, where houses dumped into the water. So yeah. in fact, this whole thing came about after Irene. Right. But so, can you go back to the other one? Yeah, so the, this distance between this line and this line is what you see in this, all these yellow areas. Yeah, the yellow area here is that thing. But in order to have river corridor and, and um, be uh, accessible to the ERAF to get the extra 5%, these little red streams are also considered river corridor. They're not, they don't have the same, they're not mapped the same, but they are, however, we wrote it, I can't remember. There's I mean, like a default 50 foot buffer on those. The yes. state hasn't gotten out to actually study the river to see where the corridor is. So and the smaller ones, it's just a 50. The state foot. came up with the yellow yes. area right. Right. and then said, whoops, we really want to add these little red areas. And the bottom line is that everything in the river corridor was actually, has been approved by Ned Swanberg at the River District uh, A&R. And so um, 
Is there a way to access this map so we can actually see it right now? Like I'm yeah, on, on the, on the Calus online web map, it'll be clearer I'm than this. I'm interested in knowing if the water on my property is having, like if the zone is changing, but I can't see that, it's too small. But I'm on the town of Calus website, is it on there? Well, the well, yeah, you can get the interactive web map via the Calus website, which is exactly what I'm doing now. John, isn't it also in the ANR interactive map, the Natural Resources Atlas, the River Corridors? But either way. So if you go to the Callus website and you go to uh, the land records, there's a thing that says interactive. John's showing. Yeah, yeah but I got to log on to the network. Yeah, it's a great tool. I use it all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, all good. I have a question about um, a river corridor. I have something in my mind when I hear the words river corridor, meaning there's a river, okay. and then there's land on either side of the river. Those red lines in particular, but also the yellow lines, are they actually moving water in all cases? Like how much land is being removed from development possibility by those lines? It varies. It's just, it's, uh, the, the states made the determination, and I'm not exactly sure what they used to do it. Um, this building was a river speed. corridor, and we got a river scientist come from it, the state and looked at, looked at it and said, the map's wrong. John, John, it's based on the volume of water going through, that's what I thought. I, I think it's actually the, the how many square, square, feet of square miles of, of, water or something like of that. watershed and, is serviced by that drainage. Right, and unfortunately, I live on a place that has a little brook. It is mapped red. <laughs> and I'm going, really? It flows very hard in the spring, and it dries up in August. And I say, really? So I questioned the river corridor myself in the, those red lines. But it, my property, I mean, I'm not going to divide it. So I gather by, you know, and I don't know about other people. You've got the same thing, I think. Uh, I have a swale on my swale, property, but, yeah. it, but it doesn't. So it only conducts water once every 20 yeah. years. And just so. but repeat the thing about it. the red lines are necessary for the 5% bump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately. The, those red lines are already protected by 50 foot stream buffers. We have a stream buffer protection that doesn't allow development and, or cutting. And so the red line stuff really isn't any different. There, there may be some towns that don't have stream buffer protection, but and so the state figures that on the, those red streams, then they'll get it. So you're saying there's no pragmatic change in there's, those red ones. There's no difference. No, you, you're not allowed to cut. You're not allowed to develop along those red streams. And I'm sorry, I can't access the Callus web map because I can't get onto the internet here. <coughs> You're saying this is not a change in the setback for current development? Not the 50-footer. Okay, so the, the bigger yellow one is, certainly. The bigger yellow one is because you can't develop there, period. But it, it's, it's just that the way they want you to have you identify those little red uh, sure. streams that they think that have speed or so much amount of water going through, and they want you to identify that in the map. James, stand up. Pardon? James, look at the map. Oh. Oh, yeah. so, I'm floundering around with the maps here. Um, and that, you know, um, are you getting at, like, what's developable here in Calus? Yeah, I mean, particularly with the river corridors, I just know, um, Sometimes there it might be a river corridor, but it's nowhere near water, for example. So, yeah. um, so I'm curious about if we're talking about land that kind of looks like it should and could be developable, but it's actually a river corridor. Because because I'm a lay person, I have no idea the answer to the question. We have certainly run into mapping errors uh, in the past, and there is a mechanism for um, having that reviewed uh, at the at the regional and state level to um, have a determination made whether the map was correct or incorrect. I, and so if, right. I'm sorry. So if you, you know, if you judge that 
that they really screwed up. That they really screwed up. Like there's a place on Jan's property that uh, that is a field. I mean, it's a wide open field, and it gets mowed every year, or it no, used to get mowed every year. And uh, um, you know that is mapped as a as a stream. Well, it, there's no stream there. Um, it's a field that water runs in sheets across. So you know her her option is to have that uh, reviewed by the state and to have a new determination made. And that's and that certainly is uh, available. That's a uh, a redress that's available. If, if I want it to develop. Now, what's interesting is when we first moved into our property, uh, they, they said we were in the, our house was in flood zone and, and that we needed flood insurance. And uh, I said, no, it isn't. The house is up. So we filed for a LOMA and we had uh, people come in and do the engineering thing and, and uh, they approved the LOMA so that it said we are not in, the, in a flood zone. It's but it's all because of these crazy little streams that we kind of have moving around the property. So I guess uh, where I wanted to go with this, this is more like a general thing is when we were doing our maps for the town plan uh, back way back when, um, you know, 11% of Calus is wetland. And then you've got over 50% is in current use. And then, five, did you say 5-0? 5-0, over 50% is in current use. And then you have um, forests and other things. I can't remember what all we had, but when you looked at what was potentially developable, bull, <laughs> it's very little. Which is a problem. It is a problem. It is a problem. Yeah, because our building is under TCTC and it would be hard to stick an apartment building in any of our village centers, I, I think. We don't have uh, septic or water in the yeah. villages, right? So, right. So, so, yeah. So, on the state level, we have this problem because they want to relegate us to building in village centers, and those aren't appropriate exactly. place to build. Right. Well, and historically, it was because they were lumber mill towns, and they were they were they were working. I mean, with the the East Cal's Grist Mill. I mean, was was. Uh, uh, miss a mill that, that was workable and adamant. I think that Corey had a mill. I don't know. Did they? I don't know. Historically, I don't remember the history. But interesting, the village centers that we're saying are village centers now. North Callis had a big uh, area that was <laughs> a, a village center in many ways. And and what happened is, you know, the mills went away and not a bitch can we talk about that. Much more from a historical perspective. <laughs> So, you know, that's where we are. And yes, that's our challenge. Or opportunity. I don't know which way you want to look at. Um, okay, we recorder. That, uh, I guess, I don't know if you want to go back to that squiggly map with the reds, but we, we, that was a big challenge for us. Uh, and we rewrote uh, uh, flood hazard overlay so that we could um, it, to, we made it better, basically, so more definitions as to what you can do and how you can do it, um, especially like the septic tanks, or I mean um, propane tanks and things like that. Um, and the whole point of that is mostly to protect the people that are kind of living there. If there's a flood or something, you, you want to make them be protected. Um, I think that's about... It's that it's it. That's it. My computer's giving up. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess so. Um, so if there's any, I mean, we'll just open it up. You folks have been asking questions, but um, is there anything more you would like to talk about? I mean, the, when, when I encourage you is to read the, the required report, because it really lays out the biggest changes that came in and the other things that are, and the changes that came about since April. Um, and other than that, I think we'll just sit and listen and um, take notes. Can you share the PowerPoint? I can share it. Or yeah. Put it on the website either one. Or okay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't have very many good notes with it. I used to do a lot of notes with, when I did PowerPoints, and this is not. But I'll I'll share. And the the map that has the layers that can be toggled on and off, we can share that as well. Um, uh, one word about it is you have to open it in Adobe Reader to get those layers 
to switch those layers on and off. Yeah. I have trouble reading maps. I'm actually better with words than that. Okay. Does anybody else want the copy of the PowerPoint? Or can we put it on the website, as was suggested? Or? Oh, yeah. We can have Jamie put it on the website. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Tegan. Can you fix the typo on page six? Oh my. It's just the <laughs> church is missing an R. It's a very tiny thing. <laughs> where, where did you find stuff. this? Bottom of the last line of page six. Church didn't have an R. We put that there just to see if you were <laughs> it. You get a gold star. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's all. That was my only complaint. <laughs> oh, oh, that's good. That's good. So, yeah. The, uh, let's see. How well, I wanted to I see. I have a question. How long did it take you to do this? We have been working on this for four years. Can we well, give them a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know enough to know yet. And I'm looking forward to reading this. But that is a lot of work. And I just want to say I really appreciate it. I worked at the Yale School of the Environment back in the day. And a lot of these water quality issues were, you know, it was just like pulling teeth to get anybody to understand oh, yeah. why you would do this in a city. And it feels really nice to live in a community where we're taking you know, such care. But thank you for all your work. Thank well, you. we have a vacancy on the commission. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you could, you could do a lot share of this. Of terminology. You could share this glory with us. <laughs> so, just so that you know, uh, the zoning regulations are a total of 116 pages now. So that's that's where we are at. Oh, sorry. I was just I was trying to wait till everybody else would have to say because I was just going to say a couple of things. But. I'm just curious about the 10% impervious surface uh, requirement and um, what sort of practical effect that is. That would that not be roads? If that that a road were to be paved, it would include that driveways, and driveways. Yeah. yeah. What was your answer, John? Driveways is considered an impervious oh. surface. They have a list. Proposed. Their big proposed plan. They have a list of all the things they can. What percentage are we currently of impervious surface? What, well, some of these smaller camps? <coughs> no, you said 10, oh, 10, you're not saying 10% of land coverage, you're saying 10% parcel. Oh, a parcel, okay, thank you. Late person. <laughs> So I have a, a bunch of more editorial comments. Should I just give them to you and do them separately? Yeah, you can. Um, you were supposed to have caught those earlier. <laughs> well, not in the shrine. <laughs> well, a bunch of them have to do with waiver. I found where you didn't take some stuff out you needed to. We took, like but that. we took the waiver out. But I know the loose ends that we got for you. Uh, you didn't take it out on page five, okay. number three, B three. It's still there. Like, and I, there's another place. So there's just okay. some things like that. that uh, I mean, you're you, amazing. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. All right. In other words, the, you're looking at kind of like corrections. I found a few things that uh, yeah. I'll just share with you there. Okay. That. All right. that would be Thank super. Thank you. Yeah. Larry. Thanks. Oh, my name's Larry Bush, if you don't know me. I'm here tonight sort of awkwardly wearing two hats, I guess. Um, because I'm the vice chair of the Conservation Commission at the moment, and I'm also a member of the Cows, Lakes, and Streams Committee. Uh, both of these, uh, both of those groups uh, have participated in this process and monitored this process best we could uh, for most, if not all, of those four years. Um, I'm happy to say that both of those organizations uh, have are going on record, I guess, tonight in supporting uh, the Planning Commission's overall revisions with regard to the shoreland zoning regulations and related matters. We didn't trouble them by following them through all the other aspects of these zoning changes. Um, I have a couple of written things which I'll submit, uh, from, one from the Planning Commission, I mean one from the uh, Lakes and Streams Committee, one from the um, Conservation Commission, uh, which uh, did hold out the possibility that some of his members could complain about the the, uh, the slope requirements and the uh, uh, the mowing requirements, but but the 
overall, um, and I don't see any comments from that, but. Oh, well, we got one in the email that I'll read. Okay. Or um, somebody. But the, but the bodies, the two bodies uh, support this and. Do you have it? Both want to thank the members of the Planning Commission for the, the, the many hours of detailed, tedious work that they've done, and we were privileged to be um, observers to quite a few of those, so we know about that. Uh, I was, <clears throat> I came prepared to, with a list of things that could um, uh, sort of indicate why, uh, especially the Lakes and Streams Committee was so enthusiastically in support of this, but I, but I won't. If anybody wants to ask me about it uh, prior to that, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. I mean, just for, to save your time. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, we in turn uh, uh, are tremendously grateful for the participation that uh, Lakes and Streams and Conservation, and particularly you and a few other people, uh, but particularly you, have helped us with in making these regulations uh, what I think are, are the perfect balance between, um, between uh, uh, protecting our this valuable resource that we're trying to protect and um, not trampling uh, property owners' rights. And um, I, I think that we've really uh, hit the nail on the head with this one, and, and uh, we couldn't have done it without you. So well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. The truth is, it's Noreen Bryan, <laughs> who is, um, has done the lion's share of the, of the, uh, the heavy lifting on this. Uh, I'm happy to, to bask in her glow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melanie, do you have Stephanie's letter? Do I have Stephanie's letter? No. Do, um, um, you want me to go ahead and read it? Do I? I'm no, sorry. I, I, no, I was just Okay. Well, um, in an email today, uh, Stephanie Kaplan sent me a letter. But I don't know if she's talking for the commission or for herself. No, it's just for herself. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read this because this is a public hearing, and I put it in for, um, for the account. Um, I'm submitting brief written comments on the shoreland zoning revisions that you have proposed. Most of these comments have been previously submitted to you by the Callis Conservation Commission, and you declined to make the suggested modifications. Thus, I am not optimistic that my comments here will have any effect, but I'm submitting them for the record. So I'm reading them for the record. Um, shoreland district versus overlay. Instead of an overlay, there should continue to be a shoreland district. The disadvantages of overlay clearly outweigh any advantages. Having a separate shoreland district underlines the importance of the shoreland and its specific standards designed to protect the water quality and other values of our lakes and ponds. It also makes the requirements for developing around the shoreline clear and minimizes confusion that often results from an overlay when essentially two different sets of district standards apply. Um, the extent of the shoreland uh, district, she would like, the shoreland district should extend 500 feet from the mean water level instead of the proposed 250 feet, except that the 800 foot district boundary proposed by the Planning Commission for the east side of Curtis Pond should be retained. According to the previously submitted chart prepared by the Depart Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, a 500-foot vegetated buffer around lakes um, provides maximum protection for water quality as well as other values. See also width of lakeshore vegetation for lake protection, Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. And she's got a website here that we can go to. Mowing. Uh, I and the Conservation Commission and the Lakes and Streams Committee have pointed out repeatedly and cited expert support that mowed grass is a poor method of capturing silt and other often harmful runoff and that if Callus is serious about protecting water quality, mowing down to the water's edge of streams as well as lakes and ponds should be phased out. In Section K of the Shoreland Standards, lawns within the shoreland vegetative buffer zone legally in existence on January 3rd, 2005, and which are mowed at least once every two years, may be maintained if no new development takes place. Her question is, what does legally in existence mean with respect to mowing lawns? I'm going to answer that right here. Uh, we change legally in existence from, uh, as a new terminology instead of grandfathered. 
How will it be determined how often landowners are or are not mowing, and how will this be enforced? Well, it's the same question that we have had in the past. How do you enforce anything? And there we are. Um, what I find, uh, well, okay, I'll just keep on reading. There is no constitutional right to mow your lawn to the water edge. The Planning Commission has the full authority to regulate this kind of mowing in the buffer zones of lakes and ponds and streams in the public interest. To better protect the water quality of our lakes, streams, and ponds, this should be done. There is a huge amount of information about and support for the types of plantings of native vegetation that can be planted in the buffer zones of the lakes and ponds and streams to best protect the water quality. Landowners who stop mowing should be provided with assistance in planting the appropriate types of native vegetation. Slopes. It is very difficult to control erosion and runoff on slopes as steep as 10%. No slope steeper than 10% should be allowed close to the lakes, ponds, or streams. It is not clear what the purpose is of allowing construction on such steep slopes close to the water bodies that we are trying to protect. So that's for the record. Was the chair of the Conservation Commission? Yes. But I think she was writing for herself because... Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. She um, is stepping down, actually. It hasn't taken effect yet because um, we weren't able to have the election meeting um, back in March, I guess. Um, but she won't be the chair after tomorrow night. Sorry. Um, Tegan, what did you find? Oh, the last line of page six. It says Old West Church, but the church didn't have an R in it, and both the... Are you talking about the report or the actual... No, the whole thing. Regulation? Right? Yeah. Did you use the one that I sent you today? I had both. I had the one dated April and the one dated October. I can't find it on my page six. Maybe it's not there. Maybe I was looking at the wrong thing. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? John? Well, we didn't touch on the DAB stuff. Oh, good point. We didn't, but there's no questions about it. No. Anyone well, interested? you can touch on it. It'd be something different. <laughs> so I'll, I'll make it real quick. Yeah. Right now, there's a process where, where if a project doesn't need a permit otherwise in the underlying district, for the most or it's rural residential. If you're changing your shutters or changing your roofing type, you don't need a permit for that. But if you're in the historic district, you do. It used to be that even changing the roof or painting your shutters a different color meant it was a trip to the DRB. We changed it so that those, those changes that don't otherwise need a permit would only need DAB approval and planning commission approval. And then the zoning administrator could, have, could sign off on the permit app. We're changing it now, so it's just DAB and uh, zoning administrator, and it's for all, all, all the things that would otherwise be considered in the underlying district. If it's if it's purely aesthetic, then uh, well, zoning administrator. Let's say someone wanted to put an addition on their house in the historic district, I could sign off on that as zoning administrator. The aesthetic impact would be reviewed by the DAB, and if they agreed with that, then I could follow up and complete the permit. Mm -hmm. But basically, the only time the DRB would be involved then would be if it required a conditional use and and the main conditional use or variance. Um, would be uh, if it was in flood hazard. We've got some stuff low down on on uh, Old West Church Road that gets close to the flood hazard area. So that's it. We're basically making it a little more streamlined, giving more control to the DAB and the ZA and cutting the PC out of the whole process. But on the advice of our lawyer, that turns out that's legally that's something we can do, and that's what we're proposing. And we did present this to send this to members that are what we had worked on after uh, after September into what they're here. We did send these changes to the DAB members, and we heard nothing back. So we assumed silence was consent. I, I got a confirmation that. They're... Okay. <laughs> so. So the DABs, they know what's going on. <clears throat> so, and they seemed pleased when we did talk about it in the initial stages. 
they were okay with it. The upside is it means that most permit applications can be processed without the time it takes to go to the DRB. Even if the DRB moves as fast as possible, there's a warning period and all the rest of the stuff that goes with it could add a couple of months to the permitting process. Hmm. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I will call the hearing adjourned.